Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. It's good to see each and every one of you here this morning. Dick Hayesmichael will be open some prayer. Let's all stand together as Brother Ray comes. Take my life and let it be. It'll be on the wall. see each of you here this morning some of you are back after uh, oh, it's been a long time since we see you I'll put it that way okay but it's good to see each and every one of you this morning uh, I got a card up here somewhere I want to read I don't know where my card's at I'll have to get it here in a second I might be on my Bible good somebody there we go okay thank you so much amen uh, it's from Dick and Millie and they're here today amen amen dear church family we just wanted to thank you for all that you have done to help us while we were ill. That's such a nice way of putting it, while we were ill. Amen. They were dying, okay, from COVID, okay. We so appreciate the food, the offers of food, the help, the calls, the texts, and especially your prayers. Pastor Bill, thank you for all that you did. We are so grateful to God and for you. We are trying so hard to be back in church, and they succeeded. Hope to see you soon. Much love and blessings, Dick and Millie. It's good to see them back. And we got others back today after being gone for a long time also. But we're so appreciative of that. A uh, couple quick things. Number one, little Travis is in church today. Amen. Nathan and Brittany brought him. But they're up there in the balcony. Always dreamed of one day having a church large enough where we had a balcony. Amen. Uh, they're in the balcony this morning. And uh, but, uh, so they're... Uh, they're practicing good separation from that baby. I don't, I don't blame them there, okay? But we need to pray for them. Any upcoming surgeries this week? I know Byron Branham is scheduled to have a hip replaced tomorrow morning. I believe it's tomorrow morning. I know it's tomorrow, sometime tomorrow. So, Mayor Byron. I know that John Harris, uh, they're laying out of church until after his surgery. He's having a knee replacement, I believe, on March 9th, if I remember correctly. Uh, but anyone else having any surgeries that we know of that we can be praying for? Okay, well, good. It's good to see you. Uh, no more surgeries. I'm always thankful for that. Don't forget, next Sunday morning, sold out. We'll be here at 11 o'clock. If you like Southern Gospel, be here. If you don't like Southern Gospel, pray for us. Amen. Uh, but they're going to be here uh, next Sunday morning, so be praying for that. And uh, it'll be a good time in the Lord. Shirley DeVore, uh, she recently lost her husband, Steve DeVore. Remember about a month or so ago, uh, her sister passed away this past week, and she's traveling up to, I believe it's Virginia or North Carolina, I can't remember right now, this morning for the funeral. The funeral will be this coming Tuesday, so remember her for traveling mercies and everything go well. So last Sunday, and uh, somebody thought it was my earring, they gave it to me, but it wasn't my earring. Uh, it's laying back around the back table. If you lost one on the way out, take a look at it, and if it's yours, you're more than welcome to take it, amen. But anyway, uh, Don and Ann Jarvis, and uh, that's a whole story in itself right now. Uh, we know that Ann had been taken to Pruitt Health in Blythewood uh, two days ago. 
uh, they had to take her by ambulance from Pruitt Health down to, I still call it Richland Memorial, forgive me, Prisma Health uh, Hospital. Her sugar had dropped to 33, and she was basically non-responsive. I mean, she and everything. And she's been non-responsive the whole time they've had her down there. I know that they did put her on life support. It is my understanding that they did take her off the life support. She is still with us right now. Uh, they, the doctor said maybe three days. And uh, they're taking Don down there today to see Miss Ann. Don has not seen her since she's gone into the hospital. Uh, Don is struggling. Okay, he's uh, struggling mentally, he's struggling emotionally, and he's struggling physically. Um, he needs a lot of prayer. He uh, he's having panic attacks, and the panic attacks aren't once in a while. These panic attacks are almost back to back. When he finishes one, he's okay for a couple minutes, and then he has the next panic attack. And so Don is really struggling right now. Anna is struggling. Uh, they need all the prayer they can get, and uh, I appreciate anything and everything that you all have and are still willing to do for them. Uh, they did request that you know we stop texting and calling Don right now because uh, he was it, there wasn't helping him with the panic attacks, trying to try, trying to answer everyone. So uh, inside that, he lost his phone for a while, but he's got it back now. That's a blessing. But uh, I didn't know if anybody had any questions about Don and Anna. I didn't want to go into that a little deeper. You know, Don's been on staff here for uh, 15, over 15 years, I know. I'm not sure exactly how long, but over 15 years. But uh, he, he's, he needs a lot of prayer. He's got some things going on in his body. He's on, I, I think, uh, an antibiotic of some sort, maybe two, I'm not sure. And so just, just be praying for them. They need, a lot of, they need a lot of prayer right now. And uh, so be praying that well, Don will do okay when he sees Miss Ann today. And so, just uh, this is just a sad. It's just sad. It's the only way I can put it. It's just sad. Uh, Ronnie Fiesel is still in the hospital. Uh, Ronnie had the bleeding on the brain. I think they've got that fixed. Uh, you know, uh, but they ain't got Ronnie fixed. Okay, uh, that'd be the best way to put it. He, he's still a mess. I was up there to see him yesterday. I know the, the Ziz has been up there also to see him. Uh, they decided they're going to keep him a little extra longer. They said, you know, you've got a, a pacemaker and that battery is only good for about another year. You're here right now and we're gonna put in a new pacemaker. It's, got, it's a pacemaker combination defibrillator in him on Monday. So he will be having surgery Monday also. So do remember Ronnie Fiesel. So that, that's actually two surgeries for Monday, Byron Branham and Ronnie Fiesel and uh, be praying for both of them. And Ronnie will tell you that he's coming home immediately after they place that in him. Now, he's been telling me he's coming home every day for the last week, okay? Tomorrow, I'm coming home, okay? But he hadn't made it yet. But, uh, but he's doing, I think, pretty good. I, don't you agree with that? He's doing pretty well. Uh, he's got a little fog in his brain from where he had the blood, blood up there for a while. But, but uh, he's getting better. He seems to be very coherent. And so we're thankful for that. Amen. Does anyone in here have COVID right now? Well, praise the Lord. Isn't that a blessing? Amen. And, uh, you know, people have asked, when, how long are we going to stay over here? Well, we may stay here until Jesus comes. He could come this afternoon. Amen. Amen. We'll, we'll still be in here. I would like to see us go at least two, probably three months with no COVID inside the church before we even contemplate making a move back over there. I don't think there's anybody in this church that wants to be back in our auditorium any more than I do. Now, the, the question is, I don't want you to answer me now, but if we were to move back in two or three months from now, and we're having no COVID cases, I, I, don't, I don't see an issue with that. But, but you know, I, I know some people, you know, are here today probably because we are meeting in the gym and we can practice social distancing, you know. And if, if that's going to be an issue for you, please let me know. I'm, I mean, I, I, I'm definitely going to take everything to, into account. I don't want to lose people just to be back in the auditorium because uh, I feel distanced from you over here. Amen. I mean, we've grown to the point that we've got people in the up in the balcony now, you know? So, <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, I don't know how that pastor, that, that pastor over First Baptist in Camden, that building is about, I don't know, looks like a quarter mile long, you know? Not that, not very wide, but really long. And I'm thinking, man, I would feel so distant. I like, I like y'all up close and personal, amen? 
And, uh, but uh, we, we want to be safe. We want to have the wisdom of the Lord before we make any moves. My, my goal would be, I, I would love by the end of summer, by the end of summer, if, again, this, everything is dependent, okay? By the end of summer, to be back in our, at the very end of summer, to be back in our building for sure, have all the Sunday school classes back in place, have the Awana program going again, have upward going again. That, that, that's my goal by the end of summer. Amen. So if y'all will stop catching COVID, <laughs> we can make that a reality, amen? But anyway, uh, but with all that being said, I think one of my greatest responsibilities is not only to preach the word to you, my, 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 my job is to protect you. And I, I wanna protect you not only spiritually, but I wanna protect you physically also, amen? So, but uh, it's just good to have you here this morning. Thank the Lord for you, amen? Let's all stand once again as Brother Ray comes again, and he's gonna lead us and draw me nearer. <laughs>
Over to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, we've got four, maybe five families that, that won't come back to church, although they desire to come back to church until everything's over or until they've had their shots or everyone else has had their shots. Uh, who all has had their shots already? Let me see a show of hands. Okay. Okay, a court. did you all look around and see each other? Look around and see each other. Because Dr. Fossey, CDC said, if you've had your shots and you wear a mask, you can hug each other. <laughs> so if you all desire a hug from like we used to do all the time, just look around. If one of those people had their hands up. We'll fill that there, uh, build it for you, okay? Uh, Ray is going to be moving into March. And... Uh, He's moving to Columbia, amen? While his house is being built here in Lugoff, his new house, okay? I just wanna get rid of all the, you know, the, the speculations and the gossip and everything else. Is Ray moving? Yeah, he said he'd had enough of us, <laughs> amen? And so Ray is looking for about 20 men. <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding. I think he's got plenty of son-in-laws or something to take care of that for him. But, but be praying for them as they make the move, okay? And uh, the, the, he's having the house built out here on Getty's Road, if you know where that's at. So just be praying that they'll get that house built fast and you can get back up here in Rudolph. And we'll praise the Lord for that, okay? Well, let's all stand in honor of God's word. I was looking in John Phillips' commentary uh, on, on the text. And uh, he made a statement in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. Paul issues a call to service. Then in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 5 to 10, he issues a call to suffering. Then in verses 14 to 17, he issues a call for separation. And then in chapter 7, verse 1, based on that call to separation, he issues a call 
to sanctification. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Father, we love you. And again, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to be able to, to gather in here this morning to the Lord, just to be able to lift up Jesus today. And Father, I thank you for each person who's here today. Lord, what a blessing it is. And Father, I pray that this time that we spend together now will be profitable time, profitable spiritually, Lord, that you might speak to all of our hearts today. Lord, my prayer is that there be a person in here today who has never trusted Christ as their Lord and Savior, that today might be the day of their salvation. But Lord, I know that I'm preaching mostly to a room full of Christians, and I thank you for that. But Father, we have obligations as a Christian, and one of the obligations we have as a Christian is to live a holy life, and we will never live a holy life without this wonderful word called sanctification. And so, Father, I pray that our hearts will be open to you, the preaching of your word today. But, Lord, that we'll not just be listening with the ears on the side of our head, but we'll be listening with the ears on the side of our heart. God, speak to all of us today. Help us to leave here differently than when we came, and we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Sanctification is a 50-cent word that means the act of making holy. The word holy, by definition, means to be cut off or to be separate. I'll talk more about that in just a second. If we as believers would live our lives in accordance with John 3.30, where Jesus is on the increase in our life and we are decreasing in our life, we would end up living the life that God wants us to live, which is a holy life. You cannot study the Word of God or read the Word of God without being confronted with the fact that our personal holiness is important to God. Our God is a holy God, and he has the same expectation of us as his children. Isaiah 6.3 says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Amen. You know, we live in a church world today. That's a whole lot different than the church world I kind of grew up in as a young believer, even at 28 years of age. Uh, we, we, we'd never heard of such a thing as a worship team. We never had flashing lights on the platform or smoke and mirrors or anything like that there. Uh, the church I got saved in didn't even have a big name preacher. He could preach the paint off the wall, but nobody knew who he was. But it's those things today that seem to get all of the attention. And so little emphasis is placed on this thing that we call holiness, particularly, I think, in our Baptist churches. God doesn't expect us to be perfect. We can't be perfect. We know that. If we say we have no sin, you know, we, we're lying. We're deceiving ourselves. And the truth not is, okay? We understand that. But God does expect us to be distinct from the world. Amen. We should smell different than the world, look different in the world, amen? Go to different places than the world goes to, all, all that kind of stuff there. I'm all for that. Amen. But let me ask you, what kind of expectations do you parents have for your children? Well, we, we, you know, we want our children to dress nice. We want our children to have good manners. Amen. We want our children to do well academically. And Lord help, well, we're in South Carolina, boy. They got to be a star athlete. Amen. You know, that's the expectations that we have for our children. Let me ask you a question. Where's holiness out of that list? Amen. Where is holiness out of that list of your expectation for your children? See, the basic concept of holiness in the Bible is this. It's a separation. Amen. It's a separation from sin and it's a separation from the world. Amen. Now, there are a lot of Baptists who believe that's it in itself. As long as we're separated from sin, or as long as we're separated from the world, we're holy. No. Missing something very important. What is that we're missing? It's not only what we separate ourselves from, but what we separate ourselves to. Amen. We have to separate ourselves to God. Amen. And if we don't do that, then we're wrong. Someone, I don't know who it was, made this statement that God does not expect us to be omniscient. God does not expect us to be omnipotent. Can't even say it. But God does expect us to be holy. Amen. Amen. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44. 
It says, For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore sanctify yourselves. You shall be holy. For I am holy. We can live a holy, a pure, and a clean life. Now, the very thought of holiness makes some people uncomfortable. They think of holiness, they think of holy rollers. Amen? Rolling in the aisles. That's not what the holiness is all about. But the truth is, even most Baptists would rather hear a message on tithing than a message on holiness. Because holiness confronts us where we're at. Leviticus 11.44 again. You shall be holy. You know, holiness just seems so far out of reach for most people. They think, man, you know, I, I'm, I'm just not there, you know. It's, a, you know, none of us in here have a problem saying, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Amen. But we have a problem with saying, I'm a holy saint of God. You know what? If you are that sinner saved by grace, you are that holy saint of God. What degree of holiness does the world see in your life? What degree of holiness does God see in your life? Because both of them should be true. Just as we can claim uh, uh, mercy, just as we can claim forgiveness, just as we can claim you know, some blessings from God, we can also claim holiness. As a child of God, it's your birthright. Leviticus 11, 44 again, it says, you shall be holy. You don't have to take it as a threat. You say, is it a command? Yeah, it's border. I'd say, if it's not, it's borderline command. But it's really this here, it's a promise. You shall be holy. God is promising each and every one of us that we do have the responsibility, we have the capability of living a holy life. It's a promise. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The matter is not so much a matter of wanting to be holy as it is of winning the battle to be holy. It seems like when it comes to the battle of holiness that we are simply not effective warriors. Hmm. We may be in the battle. Most of us are in the battle of some sort all the time anyway. And sometimes we don't even understand what we're in the battle for, but we know we're supposed to, you know, we're Baptists. We're supposed to be fighting somebody or something. Amen. I think the, the world, the flesh, and the devil would be a place to start, not each other. Holiness. Holiness does not mean sinless perfection. It means that we have been set apart from something to something. Amen. It means we've been cut off from something to something. Amen. Let me say this here. If you simply just cut yourself off from something and not to God before long, you'll find yourself walking in a direction where you need to be cut off from that also. So if we're going to be separated, we got to, yes, we got to live a life that is well pleasing to the Lord. We'll not do that if we do not desire holiness in our life. Purity, sexual purity, morality, all those things that we don't see much anymore. Let me ask you something, church. You don't have to answer this. You don't have to raise your hand. But when's the last time you asked God, make me holy? Do you desire holiness? Do you desire to be set apart for God's use? Holiness begins in the mind. I want to read from Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. I can quote this verse. It's just I'll get all these things mixed up. I'll get them in the right order. So I guess I can't quote it. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, what sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are a good report? If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. 
Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. And the peace of God shall be with you. If you want to live a holy life, you have got to learn to think holy. That's it. You know, sin is a challenge to holiness. The world, the flesh, is a challenge to our holiness. Peer pressure. Amen. Let me say that again. Peer pressure can be a challenge to holiness. Amen. Apathy, indifference can be a challenge to holiness. Friends. Uh-oh. Friends? Oh, yeah. Amen. Friends can be a challenge to holiness. In, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Holiness is not some spiritual state of ecstasy. Holiness is a verb of action. It's who we are. And because it's who we are, it's what we do. Adrian Rogers said, your mind is a battlefield. You're ready to fight. This world places all kinds of images in front of us. And these images are designed to get us to fail in our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of them are very obvious. And some of them are just slick. But I'm going to be honest with you. Most of them are just obvious. I made this statement a week or two ago. That I believe those little things that you carry in your purse and your wallet. Could possibly be the downfall of America. That little personal computer you got with you all, everywhere you go all the time. And some of the images that sometimes pop up on a phone when you've not been anywhere you're not supposed to be. Can you imagine what they look like? When you have been someplace where you're not supposed to be. It's real quiet in the Baptist church. When you start talking along those lines. I mentioned this morning. During Sunday school. That Jonah had a. Basically an in your face message. And when it comes to holiness. It ought to be an in your face message. It ought to be an in your heart message. Satan is trying to destroy America and the way he will destroy America is by destroying the church and the way he will destroy the church is by destroying holiness in our lives. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, don't turn there, you had to put it on the screen, but in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, in verses 10 to 13, Paul was praying for the Christians at Thessalonica and he prayed for three things. He prayed for their faith, he prayed for their love, and he prayed for their holiness. If we're not careful, we will allow the world to influence us more than the word. And by the way, the word cannot be influencing us if we're not in the word. If we're not reading it, not studying, not meditating on it, not memorizing it. Holiness is more than just laws and regulations. Holiness is a way of living. When we focus on God, that's what it's going to take. We will have to focus on God. It will motivate us to please Him. I, I love those words of Jesus over the Gospel of John, where He said, "I do always those things that please the Father." Boy, I wish I wish that was my testimony. I do always those things that please the Father. Let me ask you a question. Do we agree that God is holy? If, if you, you can say amen. I know, I know it's bad. Do we agree God is holy? Amen. amen. Do we agree that we're God's children? If you've been, if you've been saved, amen. do you agree? Amen. Do you agree that God the Holy Spirit lives in his children? Amen. Do you agree that God has a desire that his children live a holy life? Amen. Then what's stopping you? It's not God. Right. 
how can we say that we embrace the God of the Bible and fail to embrace a holy lifestyle? Because God in the life of a believer will express himself in a life of holiness. Listen, it doesn't mean you go around and you're a sourpuss and you can't smile and you can't have fun and you can't joke around. That's what a lot of people think holiness is. You have to be somber. That's dead. Amen. Amen. See, our call to holiness is based on the character of God. The fact that our God is a God of holiness. You know, if our faith is matured, that's going back to First Thessalonians 3 a while ago. If our faith is matured, if our love is abounding, there will be a desire for holiness in your life. You know, I was talking a while ago. Parents, what is your expectation of your children when it comes to holiness? Parents, what is your expectation of yourself? Grandparents, what is your expectation of yourself when it comes to this thing that we call holiness? It begins in our mind. Uh, over in Titus chapter 2, I'm going to read uh, four verses over here. Uh, it begins in our mind, but if it's not evidenced in our lives, then something is wrong. Titus 2 verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. That's what I'm looking at right now. Some peculiar people. But that's a good thing. Oh, you thought I meant peculiar in a different way, didn't you? Okay. Zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Holiness begins in the mind, but it works its way out. Isn't it strange that when we do run into somebody... Who's really close to God, got a good walk with God. A lot of times we look at them and they're, just, they're a little weird. They're just a little bit strange. They, 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 they've just been touched a little bit. They've been touched a lot. And they've been touched by the right hand. Amen. 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 I've got a young man I'm thinking of right now. I don't want to mention his name. Because he lives semi-local. So I'm going to go back a little further than that. I'm going to go back to a little girl that used to ride my bus. And a little boy. Back when I was driving a bus for Grace Baptist Church down in Goose Creek, South Carolina, if I got saved. I'd run that bus route. I'd go out, I'd pick up those kids, and I'd bring them in. And we were picking up the worst possible kids you could possibly think of in the worst possible places and bringing them to church. And sometimes they cause the worst possible results too. Amen. But we kept picking them up. And we, we kept bringing them in. And, I, and, you know, and there are certain ones of them now that, that stand out in my mind. Uh, that one little boy named Damon. Every week, my wife was the, my wife taught junior church. I was the bouncer. She knew more Bible than I did. I didn't know any Bible. I just got saved. And she was teaching junior church. So I was the bouncer. And every week I learned who's not going to be good. And that little little boy, Damon. And I'd go out. And I'd jerk him up by the shirt and the chairs. Like, off his chairs. Like I said, and carry him over and put him on a three-legged stool up front. I said, you're going to sit right there. And he was in hog heaven. Amen. He was just looking for a little bit of attention, a little bit of love. I gave it to him. But when I was taking those kids home, and they were getting off the bus, they were rowdier getting off the bus than they were getting on because we'd fed them all kinds of drinks and cookies and everything else. You know, they, they're on a sugar high. 
And every one of the kids that we call normal kids getting off the bus, we just jump off the bus, they may say bye. But there was a couple kids on that bus that weren't normal, kind of like the bus driver. And when they get off the bus, before they walk down that step to get off the bus, they would turn to the driver, they would throw their arms around the driver's neck and say, I love you. And I started thinking about that, you know, years later. I went smart and figured out the time. But years later, as I look back at it, I started thinking, you know what? Those were the most normal kids on the bus. None of those other kids told me they loved me. Just those two right there. Listen. Holiness. I said earlier, you know, faith and love. If your love is abounding, then you're going to have no issue with holiness. It's not a religious concept. Holiness is a concrete lifestyle. And once you've experienced it, experienced it you'll never want to go back. See, the law cannot legislate morality. The law cannot even, cannot even legislate morality. And therefore, it cannot legislate holiness. You cannot live a Christian life and not practice holiness. You say, well, preacher, I'm a Christian and I don't really think I'm not all that holy, to be honest with you. I said you couldn't live the Christian life. What's the word Christian mean? Christ-like. You cannot live a Christ-like life if you are not practicing personal holiness. And so it's going to take a definite effort on our part. It's not a matter of saying, okay, Lord, here I am. I'm your child. I've been born again. I want to be holy. Zap me. And all of a sudden, you're holy. It don't work that way. Wouldn't it be wonderful if it did? But if we're going to be holy, we've got to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. Hmm. Verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians, when, when, when they make a profession of faith, their values do not seem to change. Everything changed when you get, everything is supposed to change when you get saved. Amen. I know everything with me changed when I got saved, and I know God has no respecter of persons, Amen. and God didn't save me any differently than he saved anyone else. Right. Amen. Four or five weeks ago, I preached a message on abortion. Abortion did not bother me before I got saved, thinking about it. Eh, whatever. And you know the truth of the matter is, I never heard my pastor preach a message on abortion before I was confronted with the issue of abortion, and I immediately knew it was wrong. Isn't that amazing? It's like somebody flipped the light off. That's exactly what happened. You know, verse 14 speaks of purity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. God is set apart from the evil in this world. We need to be set apart from the evil in this world. That's why we have to be careful about the places we go. That's why we have to be very careful about choosing our friends. And I'm going to make all the teenagers mad right now. Sometimes the parents need to help the children choose their friends. See, holiness is not simply that we don't do this and we don't do that.
spiritual battle. And, 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 and most believers, are, they feel like they're not designed for battle. The moment you got saved, you were designed for battle. The moment you got saved, you had the opportunity to put on the whole armor of God. Amen. Holiest will not come without a battle. Satan is our enemy. He doesn't want you to be holy. But with God's help, we can win. And when you stop and think about it, man, the stakes are so high. I believe the stakes are higher now than they've ever been. So we have a responsibility to develop a pattern of holiness in our lives. You'll have to get into the Word of God. You'll, you'll have to do more than just read a chapter a day and, and close it up and not even realize what you read. You know why? Because I've done that many times. How many of you ever read a chapter? You close it and think, what will I just read? I know I just read it. I have no idea. I read a proverb. I read a proverb every day. I won't be honest with you. Unless I stop and study them, half of those proverbs I read, I have no idea what they're talking about. I go, good night. And it jumps from this subject to this subject. It's like that, that fast. And I'm supposed to comprehend all this stuff. No, I'm supposed to stop and study it. Meditate on it. Try to figure out what the Word of God is trying to teach me. But we're going to have to read the Word of God if we're going to be holy. We have to pray. And when we pray, the Bible says you have not because you ask not. You know why most Christians are not holy? Because they have not asked God for holiness. Let me say this here. Why is that, that we don't ask for God for holiness? Because we understand that if we ask God for this and God answers that prayer, that there will probably be some things in our life, in our family, in our home, that may have to change. Priorities will all of a sudden be rearranged. Uh-oh. We're not all for that. Church will be a priority. Amen. Facebook Live, for those who are shut in, will be a priority. Amen. And so, as we pray, as we open ourselves up to God, God... God, God, here I am. I want you to look at me real good and see where I need help at. And all of a sudden, if you don't know, God will show you your weaknesses. But I'm going to be honest with you. Most of us know our weaknesses. And because we know our weaknesses, we do not want to be holy because we know that we'll have to confront those weaknesses. And if we confront those weaknesses, then things are going to have to change. All of a sudden, places that used to be okay to go to, no longer okay. Amen. I, I, I share with you again, you know, how, how God, immediately after my salvation, just, I knew right from wrong. I'm not saying I always did right. I'm saying I did know right from wrong. You've heard me share in my testimony how that first Friday, after I've been saved, the divers down at the dive, our dive locker down there, we always knocked off on noon Friday, and we went down to this bar on Spruill Avenue. If you don't think about old Charleston, you know Spruill Avenue is a bad place to be. And I went down there that Friday, and I rode a 10-speed bicycle back and forth to work, and I parked my bike out front. I went in. I knew I wasn't going to drink. I went in and ordered a Coke. I'm drinking a Coke. I'd have normally been drinking a beer. Just to be honest with you. I'm not bragging on it. I'm not actually shameful of it. And I'm sitting there drinking that Coke, and I started thinking about that bike parked out front of that bar. I'm thinking, what if my preacher comes by and sees my bike? You know what that was? That was conviction. You know, you know how strong that conviction was? That preacher didn't even know I owned a bike. But I was concerned about it. I was concerned enough about it that I went out to the front of that bar, got that bike, and took it and parked it around behind the bar. Which was basically an invitation for my bike to be stolen. And I went back in, and I'm drinking that Coke, and I'm, I'm talking to all my buddies there, the divers. And a thought came to me, Lord, I know I'm drinking a Coke. You know I'm drinking a Coke. But every one of these divers think I'm drinking a rum and Coke. And I remember I put it down on the bar or the table. I can't remember if I was at the bar table. But I remember I put it down and I walked out. And I didn't go back. Amen. I, didn't feel, I didn't feel right in that atmosphere. 
Now, nowadays, you know, you, you go into a, a restaurant, you know, you, know, you want to be sitting over in the bar section? Well, I, of course I want to be at the bar section. That way some of my church members can come in and see me over in the bar section or at Chili's. No, I want to be as far away from that cotton picking, stinking thing as I possibly can be, amen? Listen, I already mentioned it, but man, I'm telling you right now, I believe, you may disagree with me, and I know how helpful mine is. But we'd probably all be better off without a cell phone. Amen. 14 people out of 100, believe that? 10%, that's not bad, amen? Listen. What do you want for your family? Well, I want them to be successful. I want them to make a bunch of money. I want them to have a, a big fancy house. I want them to have multiple automobiles, any kind of car they want. I want to have money in the bank. Isn't it amazing how we as parents always want our children to have more than what we had? Well, preacher, I grew up poor. And I went, Did it kill you? How many in here grew up without a cell phone? Let me see a show of hands. And here we are. We've made it. Could you imagine if I went around this room right now from everybody that's, let's say, 17 or 18 and below, give me your cell phone. Right there, buddy, sister. And we go, I get up here and I throw them up beside the wall as hard as I could. What's going to happen? Oh, the teens will be crying and the parents will be all over me. I paid a thousand dollars for that cell phone. <laughs> and you got a problem too. <laughs> Lord, I went from holiness to digging a grave all at one shot. <laughs> Listen, I want God's best for you. But you have to want God's best for yourself. You have to want God's best for your children. How do you get that? I just told you. You have not. Because you ask not. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Some of the parents probably need to throw their cell phone upside the wall too. Amen. Grandparents. How not to build a church 101. First and foremost, are you sure you're saved? I know I've preached to Christians this morning. But are you sure of your salvation? If you are sure of your salvation, our heads will be bowed, our eyes will be closed, mine will be bowed, my eyes will be closed. You say, do we know that for sure? You can go back on Facebook and look later. My head will be bowed, my eyes will be closed. So the only person who will probably know that, if you raise your hand right now, will be you. But if you know for sure, that you're saved. Would you simply slip your hand up and say, I know that I know that I know that I'm saved. My hand is up. I don't see any other hands. I'm looking down. My eyes are closed. I'm bringing my hand down. You can bring yours down. And I'm now looking up. I did not see if every hand went up or not. My guess would be that not every hand did go up. If your hand did not go up, I want to thank you for being honest with yourself. But now what are you going to do about it? I'm going to be standing down front. If you know that you need to be saved, and if you want to be saved, if you'll walk down front while we're singing, I'll be down front, I'll meet you down here, and we'll take the Bible and show you how you can be saved, how you can know for sure you're going to go to heaven when you die. Would you be willing to do that? But Christians, parents, grandparents, I want to pose that question to you once again. Where is holiness?
on the list when it comes to your children and the things that you want them to attain in their life? Have you attained it? If not, why don't you come and ask God for it? Maybe, you're, maybe your walk with the Lord is good. Maybe, maybe things are, are good. Maybe you feel like you, you live that holy life. Again, let me say this here. We're all more comfortable saying that I'm a sinner saved by grace, that I am a saint of God, and I understand that. But both are true. Would you come and pray for your personal holiness? Would you come and pray for your children or your grandchildren's holiness? You can bring your family with you and pray, and kneel at an altar and pray. I understand you can make your, that chair out there an altar, and I know that too. But holiness is something that God desires from you. Father, this is your invitation. And Lord, as always, my prayer is you do with it as you see fit. I know I've preached the message that you want me to preach today. Lord, the results, they're in your hands. I lift this body of believers to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand our feet. We'll send him with invitation. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Take up my cross and follow me. I heard my master say, I gave my life to ransom me. Surrender your all today. Wherever. hospital uh, remember those will be having their surgeries tomorrow and uh, just pray one for another amen god bless you i love you in the lord look forward to seeing you back here hopefully tonight at six o'clock amen we'll close out by singing the family of god